Hello everyone. Well, I'm still recovering from the organization of the 10th Fabla conference last July in Barcelona, uh, in which we were celebrating this kind of 10 years of, of Fab Labs, no? And, and many questions can, have come during these 10 years. I mean, um, what is going to come next? Is it going to be 90 years of Fab Cities? Uh, are Fab Labs going to be something more than a cool nerd club? So those are some of the questions that, that, that we, have point, we pointed out in, in, in this um, Fab Lab meeting. No? But as you know, when we, when we try to talk about the relationship between Fab Labs and Fab Cities, it comes also in, comes maybe in a, something that is more broader. No? It's the relationship between technology and humans and how bringing back, again, Mr. Jeremy Rifkin, how the different technological revolutions had led into big change in the, in the, in the way we live, in the way we relate with each other, and with the, in the way that society is being organized. No? And basically, today's capitalism is being built on industrialized uh, kind of revolution that happens around, I don't know, you can call it 150 years, 200 years ago. And basically powered also by the, the ability of communication to spread the knowledge all, all, all around the world. Um, but we, have, we will see further how this is slightly changing. No? But out of this uh, old model that we are exhausting, we have created like a standardized world in which things are produced somewhere, they are shipped somewhere else. I, I guess those are things that you already know how it happens, that you can buy a Malboro, Malboro cigarettes in, in the Artanti, in Antarctic uh, um, in the Antarctic Ocean, or you go to Australia, or even uh, whatever city that you can imagine in the world, no? But it ha it's happening not only with this kind of consumption goods, but also in the, in the technology we use, and the things that we kind of interface to build our everyday life is basically produced in a standardized way. And basically what we have to do is to choose from whatever oceans are, are given to us, no? It's, it's the mystery around it, no? So then, uh, um, what we are kind of learning is just how to pick things, you know, how, if we were chickens sitting in front of food and we just have to eat it and, you know, wait for someone else to actually use us for to feed something else. It is actually what is happening <laughs> in today's world. Um, but then um, now is, is a moment in which many people is thinking about the future, no? And then we can see that now, you know, embedded or wearable technologies are going to lead the future. Or robots are going to replace what we do is going to lead the future, or things that fly and deliver things are going to lead the future. And then, you know, what's, what, what's kind of, a, you know, this one of constructed visions of the future is the same things that we have today, but with flying things around it. But this is, this is nothing new. I mean, and, and, and then maybe thinking about the future is already an idea of the past, no? So we have generating wonderful technologies, thinking of imagining a near futures, but actually, the present is being in front of us, is passing through us, and then it's, it's basically the future is now. No? So what uh, has been happening is that in the last 50 years, computation, or 70s, 50, 60, you, you can call it, computation and internet are powering our life. No? Uh, one of uh, the results is that all of us are carrying two, three, four devices that you're actually sitting now communicating with other people while I'm talking. and then. Um, this is not that old, actually, and, and the way that we have boosted the way, uh, or, 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 or the, boost, the boost that the use of, of these technologies in a more social way had happened. So only 10 years ago, Facebook uh, was, was launched, or, or YouTube. Uh, YouTube has changed the way we used to access to content, going from the TV model in which someone broadcasts content, and you just have to see it and make sure that you're right on time where the content was delivered. Now, you basically choose whenever you want to see that content, and more importantly, you can produce content and share it. No? And then tools like Twitter that we know how, how useful they have been. But it, somehow, we have these amazing tools, and we use it to take pictures of food and share it with, with our friends, which is OK. But then, in, in some other cases, maybe a little bit uh, taken into an extreme. I'm sure that it's not only Twitter that is changing or causing the, the hard up, uh, spring, but it helped, let's say. No? Um, so. Um, what happens when we put in this idea of, of, of personal computation or distributed computation and distributed communications, the idea of distributed manufacturing, uh, so you can, you can imagine. It's not only 3D printing. It's tools like Arduino that, again, is, is just recently uh, being added into, into the set of tools that we have. 
is uh, 3D printing or accessible 3D printing, and it's not even 10 years old when, when RepRap came into life. And there are places like FabLab, yeah, Nadia and I, we work together, kind of the same thing, so we can share some of these slides. <laughs> Um, and that are being spread around the world and that are allowing people to get access to this kind of tool to produce things and to share them. Um, and then it's building basically a distributed manufacturing ecosystem. No? And, and, and I think that Nadia has, has been pointing out some facts, some key facts on, on the way on how you produce things. Not only things and objects that you use, but actually even being able to produce the tools that you need to produce things. No? Um, so this is the, this is the thing. No? We're having access to tools to make tools that can change probably cities or can change the way we live, or we can take the decisions on how we want them to change our life. Um, this is, again, things that we pointed out in the, in the, in the FAB conference uh, this year in Barcelona, in which um, we launched the idea of, uh, you know, in order to scale up the possible impact of FABLAS, we need to think around how society is going to be reconfigured, how people is reorganizing themselves on how they share uh, projects, how they launch it, how they go to market without, um, by kind of skipping the traditional path of, of uh, you know, a clear example is crowdfunding. Everyone, uh, everyone knows about it. Then to think about how digital fabrication technologies are evolving and then are, are bringing a better, more sustainable, faster tools to produce things, to, proto to go from prototype to product. And then to think about how cities can basically recover the ability of being productive. If you think about how cities operate today, they basically import things that have been produced thousands of miles away. We process those things, we produce trash that we don't use, basically. No? So you think and at the end of the day you're a big producer of trash. Um, and then how we can move forward and using this uh, kind of new manufacturing ecosystem in, a, in cities that can basically close the cycle of the matter within an acceptable radius. No? Uh, we engaged the mayor of Barcelona to take a, a, a challenge. Um, this is the way in which he, he passes the torch to Sherry Lassiter to organize the FAB conference in next year in, in Boston. Uh, and basically, the, the, uh, Barcelona, uh, the Barcelona mayor, he, he, I don't know if he knew that what he was doing, but he pressed a button saying that in 40 years, Barcelona should be self-sufficient. No? Uh, he might be aged and he didn't understand the type of challenge, but the, the, the idea of, of Barcelona being self-sufficient is basically being able to produce energy locally, to produce food locally, and to produce things locally. And then the only things that come in and out of the city is basically information and data to turn that information into things through local manufacturing technologies. This is kind of starting to happen. This is, this is the Fab City project, uh, which is being launched in Barcelona a few years ago. And now we are constructing a network of, of uh, kind of urban fab labs that are bringing tools for people to produce stuff. No? Um, this is kind of uh, imagining that you have heard, you might hear before, um, kind of libraries of the future, but with more challenges uh, to come. No? So, because when um, public, uh, some of these labs are public, are being run by the government. Imagine when the government trying to organize a a fab lab or a hackerspace or a makerspace. So the main question is this, does fab labs need to be bureaucratized and get inserted into kind of official system or does the government need to be hacked no? and then operate in a different way? So these are the kind of tensions that we are facing today. And also, I guess that other, other type of, of challenges is what are the things that are being produced within these places? It's, it's really for whoever to come in and produce farting robots and do whatever they want, or, or it's really to kind of use these places to produce impact in the urban scape. No? Um, out of this reflection, I, I want to introduce a project that I, I funded uh, together with colleagues, colleagues a couple of years ago. Uh, that is called Smart Citizen and has been nurtured in, in Fabla Barcelona. And it's with the idea of this access to, to these tools, these prototyping tools that I mentioned before, how we can create more tools that can improve uh, or, or the people's life in cities. No? So basically from the idea of how we produce data and how we use it in cities. In this sense, we have the ability of uh, streaming, producing information that can affect the behavior in people in the cities. And then for them, uh, and then again change the data that is being feedback and then to understand how the urban systems live uh, or how the city operates in a different layer that we haven't explored that much. No? Even when sensing has been uh, talk and talk for many years, there is not such a thing uh, as a 
you know, kind of very reliable or, or very kind of strong urban sensing practice uh, that you can say is happening today, even with all the race of smart cities now. Um, so basically, we wanted to make that, as I said, make visible the invisible, and that we do it through sensing the city, acquiring the information that is surrounding us that we don't see but actually affect the way we live. And then at the same time, provide the tools for people or for citizens to participate in what the city is, in the production of the city by this information layer. And doing through open source tools, of course. No? So we, we basically built on top of Arduino a sensor board. And, and, and to do that and to develop that, we did a first crowdfunding campaign. We raised 15, uh, 14,000 euros. Then we could build a team, uh, a small team, that led us to the first prototypes of a, of a kit, uh, as I said before, with a Wi-Fi antenna and some sensor boards that basically was capturing this, this, and, and this initial phase, capturing these uh, variables from the city. No? Um, very much imp inspired in the air quality egg and inspiring the, the patch wave movement. And then basically, I, I always say that we exist or we, we kind of have been some kind of successful because patch wave was sold by Usman Hack to lock me in and because air quality egg uh, uh, lost the support from Cosm a few years ago. So basically, we take kind of that position and we, take it for we took it further. Then after that, we did a Kickstarter campaign. I think you know, this is boring. Some, most of you have done Kickstarter campaigns. And then we did a most beautiful version of that. No? And now SmartCitizen.me smart is, a, is, a, is an online platform that has, is taking data from more than 800 sensors around the world that has been acquired through crowdfunding or uh, by buying in our, in our, in our store. And uh, today we have, uh, uh, as I say, 785 kids that have posted at least once to the platform. And then we have 227 million data points that have been produced so far um, in, our, in our store. And then basically we are almost everywhere uh, in, in, in the planet with a lot of challenge to come. Um, let's say, the, the, I think that what, what made the project successful somehow, successful quote unquote again, uh, it's, it was not the, the technolo technological advance, advancement, no? um, advancement, and we have, as I said, we built on top of projects that existed before. But basically, we kind of raised, we were, we were an experiment of critical design against the, the, the whole smart city agenda being developed by IBM, Cisco, and the big players saying, you know, we're going to develop an infrastructure in the city that is going to provide technology to manage and control the city. You say, well, if you're going to have a smart city, you, know, you cannot have stupid citizens. No? So in a way, we raise that voice, and, and that's why the, the, the project gained some attention. No? This is the president of Cisco featuring a smart citizen in the Internet of Things World Forum. And he's the evil of, of a big, these big companies. He said, basically, if there is someone in the, if they, you know, the, how do you call it, the hell exists, this guy is the evil. And, 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 and the smart cities ecosystem. And, and so we managed to get there inside, inside the beast, if you want to call it. And then we won in the, in the Smart City Expo with all the, you know, kind of the evil meeting. We won the uh, Innovation Award, you know, Innovative uh, Initiative. And then I remember when I was going to take the prize, the other guys, they were not even shaking my hand. They were very bad. So, but we won to uh, companies like Schneider of the City Council of, of Toronto. Um, and then, thanks to that, we started to gain some traction from other cities to implement the smart citizen in a more top-down uh, strategy, or a mixed strategy. You know? And this is the case of the Amsterdam Smart City project. They acquired smart citizen kits to basically deploy the technology with their citizens. No? So, um, we did uh, uh, some workshops together with the VAC Society in Amsterdam uh, to a three-month experiment, and now it keeps growing. And we keep doing some research on what are, which are the effects, which are the conclusions that we can take on how people approach these technologies, how they use it, and what they expect from them. You know? uh, we're doing the same in, in Manchester with the support of Future Everything and, and Intel, by the way. And, and the same. You, we, we basically develop a workshop and try to gain some co community building around the project and try to get people encouraged to, to use these kind of tools for, for the production of data in the city. You know? Um, and of course, we started to, to, to find some challenges that made people some kind of be a little bit um, doubtful about the success of, of these kind of technologies. And there are some of the things that we are working now in our, our next versions. No? Um, we are engaging the creation of a community, of course, through, through online platforms like, uh, like forums. But also, it's important to keep the local championing. And, and we are doing that through 
some research papers in which we're finding that like, the companion of it is not enough with the technologies, but actually you need the support to, to the development of these technologies to be successful. We're about to launch a new website as well. Uh, it's going to be released hopefully in the next month. And then I think that what is important is to think that the creation of open source tools or this kind of more bottom-up approaches is not only for, for citizens to be, to, to be renegades, again, the bad people, but actually we need to think that we need to work with those things, those people that we think they're bad, but they could be our best partners. And that's, that's I think, that the articulation between these players and the creation of tools out of places like Fab Labs and makerspaces will help to create more impact in, in the way these technologies can, can reach out into the change of, of city and society and not only being a self kind of achievement. No? And I think that with that, uh, I would like to finish. I think I took more time and thank you very much.